going to do. It's about three minutes after the hour. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining. Um, if you see me kind of looking off to my right, it's because I have two monitors set up. I have my PowerPoint deck in front of me and I have the application, the hop-in application to my right. And so I'll be kind of looking at the chat. I'm kind of on my own today. So kind of forgive me if you see me bouncing around a bit, but um, I'll be looking at the chat and we will have some time at the end for questions. So as we navigate the session today, if any specific questions come up, I know that there is a Q&A panel, if you will, in the application. Um, it might be a good idea to use that. So that way I can go in and take a look there and I can, I, you know, all of the questions are in one place. So I'm not doing a whole lot of scrolling. So We'll have opportunities to use the chat today, but for any questions, please go ahead and use the Q&A, okay? So thank you again for joining. I wanna introduce myself. My name is Camille McKinney. I am a leadership coach and consultant. I'm in the Southern California area. Um, I would love it if in the chat, you would go ahead and enter where you're calling in from. Uh, I know that a lot are probably gonna be in North America, maybe a few out of uh, the country, but I would love to hear where you're uh, calling in from. I know that for most, if you are not in North America, that means this is evening for you. So um, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, and I know that the conference organizers do as well. So anyway, great to meet all of you. Philadelphia, San Jose, wonderful. Toronto, Canada, I have a client. I have one client now. Uh, in that area. So thank you for uh, dialing in. This is perfect. Phoenix, Arizona. I was there two weeks ago at another speaking event. So uh, perfect. Toronto. There you go. <laughs> St. Louis. Wonderful. Thank you again so much, Kathy. Welcome to the call. So let's go ahead and jump in. So as I mentioned, let me go ahead and get here, you know, for taking notes, I don't, like I said, I don't give out my PowerPoint deck. I don't think it's really helpful. And so what I do instead is I create an action guide. And it's really an opportunity for you to take the notes that are relevant for you as I move through this presentation. There's some space on the last page of the action guide for you to take just whatever notes you want. And um, there's some other information in there. So. Um, if you haven't already, go ahead and scroll up back into the chat. You'll see a link to my Dropbox where I've put that action guide. You can go ahead and print that up. Again, it's only three pages versus 30 plus PowerPoint slides. So I think that'll be a little bit uh, better use of your time as well. So go ahead and um, you'll see in the action guide that there are occasional pencil icons on a slide. And what that is is a cue for you to enter something in your action guide, okay? So I try to kind of make it easy and a little fun as well. So what we're gonna do is just start with a question. And this is actually, and you'll see the pencil guide on the slide. I wanna know why this topic is important to you. And I asked that question because my presentation is one of many that are available to you in this hour. And so I'm curious why you picked mine. Um, I think it's also important for you to acknowledge this for yourself. Why is this title, this topic title important to me? What drew me to it? Um, because that might give you a little insight into, um, again, why it might be important to you. So go ahead and jot that down in your action guide. And if you're open to it, go ahead and Bindi has just given us an example. She's put it in the chat. Thank you, Bindi, for kicking us off here. So go ahead and enter that in the chat if you're willing to share with your colleagues in the session. We got 13 people so far in the call. This is great. Take a moment to do that. So as you're doing that, and I'll kind of keep an eye on the chat as well as, as while I uh, continue to move through the talk, so I'm going to make a statement here, and I'll be curious what you all think, um, but this is something that I believe to be true. Um, we all have a brand. Bindi, you've talked about, you've mentioned here executive presence. 
your current degree of executive presence is known by others. So you have a brand, whether you know it or not. Okay. The goal would be to have a brand that you design yourself versus one that is a default based on how others experience you. Okay. So just give that a little bit of thought. So I want to kind of share with you how others have described my brand. And this is particularly when I was in my default brand stage. Okay. So first of all, you know, people would say, call Camille, she'll have the answer. And I kind of made it and had a belief as a leader that I needed to have all the answers. And if I didn't have the answers, that I knew where to find them. And to a degree that is true, but do I really need to have all the answers? Uh, not really, okay? But this is how people perceived me. Call Camille, she'll have the answer. Um, I need to talk to the quote unquote boss. I enter this because it's kind of a, this is a running joke here in my house. This is typically what my husband will say when someone is knocking on our door trying to sell us pest control or electrical panels. So it's like, this is his out. I have to talk to the boss, the boss being me. And finally, you always get it done. And this is, you know, this is probably true. I have a pretty strong integrity value. So if I tell somebody I'm going to get something done, they can pretty much count on it. So people do perceive me this way. Now, like I said, this these were things that people might say about me when I was in my default brand. All right. So at some point, I must have wanted this to be how people saw me because this is how I behaved. These were the choices I made. I will have all the answers. I will always get it done. And I need to be part of the decision-making process, husband, when somebody comes up the door, to the door trying to sell us something. So this, again, I must have wanted this. Do I want this now? No, this is not my designed brand anymore. Okay. So for years, I believed you must work hard to succeed, okay? How many of you, if you have any degree of this belief yourself, go ahead and enter it. Say a yes or a no in the chat, okay? I'd love to know if you kind of have a similar belief. Ah, absolutely. Thank you, Cassie. <laughs> yes, definitely. Plus one. Yep. Okay. So I'm not alone here, all right? But for years, I believed I must work hard to succeed. So what does working hard look like? What's interesting is that it looks different for each of us. Many of you, right, are agreeing with me. Yes, I have this belief, but it may not be expressed in the same way as mine. So for me, what does it look like? It looks like I am very productive. Again, I get stuff done. There is something about that to-do list and the satisfaction of crossing off an item from that list or checking the box that is very satisfying, okay? If you agree with that, go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, I'm also very responsive. When I see that number next to my email icon on my laptop or on my iPhone, I'm drawn to it like a bee to, <laughs> you know, to a flower. I want to find out what is going on, okay? Um, thank you, Cassie. I am a, a zero notification gal, right? I want, at the end of the day, I want there to be zero next to that icon, <laughs> all right? So I am very responsive, kind of have my own personal service level agreement, if you will, with myself. I respond to messages. I also have very high standards for not only the amount of work I get done, which is the productivity, but also the quality of my work. Uh, you know, I do have absolutely some perfectionist tendencies. I will rework something until I am completely satisfied with it. Is it perfect? 
Probably not. Does it reach my standard? Yes. So I do have pretty high standards. Now, here's what happens when I'm working hard on steroids. I am more, I am like chronically, you know, working chronically long hours. You know, it's not unusual for me to be in my family room with the TV on because I would like the noise with my laptop on my lap and I'm working on something. Okay. So I do tend to work chronically long hours. Um, that can lead to burnout. Gratefully, I have other ways of balancing today. But before, you know, when I was really in this, again, default brand of mine, burnout was like I was right on the edge, right on the edge. And ultimately, what this resulted in was a stalled career. And that's really what I'm going to spend some time talking to you about today and things that we each can do to address that. All right. And by extension, a lot of these other things. And often it's just about having awareness that I am tipping the scales at productivity. I'm tipping the scales at responsiveness. I'm tipping the scales at high standards, working those long hours on the edge of burnout. You know, if you can relate to any of this, again, go ahead and put, you know, indicate that in the chat. I would appreciate that. So I want to tell you a story, you know, kind of the story that got me where I where I was. All right. So I want to introduce you to my parents. <laughs> this is my mom and my dad. Um, a little bit of history. They both came from what I would what I would identify as very humble beginnings. My dad um, was born in Hawaii on the island of Kauai, if you're familiar, and uh, his family immigrated from um, Madeira, Portugal, um, back in the late 1800s. And so my dad and, and was born there. His family, uh, many of his family is still there. And um, they basically worked and lived in the sugarcane fields of Hawaii. My mom, conversely, uh, was born in rural Tennessee. Um, and she was born during the Depression. So given that background, you can imagine the experience that they both had. And uh, just so you can get to know me, that's me in the back. I'm kind of the ori original photo bomber, if you will. I don't think I was meant to be in this picture, but I showed up and had to pose. So <laughs> that's me. Um, but my parents both wanted better for their kids. And um, I was the oldest, so I was also kind of modeling a lot of, and kind of the, you know, I was the one they tried it out on. Let's see what we can do to help our kids be more successful and more um, abundant than we were, okay? So as I was growing up, I was absolutely my dad's daughter, for sure. Um, he had very high expectations of me, and that was in you know schoolwork, <clears throat> any kind of extracurriculars. I took piano lessons. I would play piano recitals. I took dance lessons, dance recitals. Super high achiever, as you can imagine. Um, he be believed, and remember the belief that I shared earlier: if you work hard, you will be successful. So. The goal was really to deliver results. So results, the metric for results when you're a kid are report cards. You know, I needed to have good grades. That demonstrated the results of all that hard work I was putting in. As I grew up, you know, that high achiever grew up too. So the clear metric of a good grade translated to performance reviews. I wanted to have really great scores on my performance reviews. And every year that was kind of like the goal. And I thought, well, if I work hard, I will succeed. So that thread kind of pulled through childhood into my adult years and my working career. At one point, I was up for a promotion at work 
and I didn't get it. And I was really confused. I was frustrated. And frankly, I was pissed off. <laughs> I did not understand why I did not get that promotion. I mean, I'm working really hard. I'm getting really great performance reviews. You know, the last job I had, um, I they rated you on a scale from one to four, one being highest. And my overall score was a one. And I thought, well, if I'm, if you're giving me a one in my performance, why am I not getting the promotion? Okay. So here was my res response <laughs> to not getting that promotion. So again, I said this and I quickly regretted it. As soon as the words came out of my mouth, I wanted to take them back. I said, my work should speak for itself. And I said it exactly the way I just did. I left space in there. I wanted to emphasize what I thought. And I remember my boss kind of looking at me like I had three heads. Like, what? You know, but that was what I believed in the moment. And what I learned after some reflection was that my work was speaking for itself, but it was speaking for the work or the job that I had, not the role I wanted. So I want you to kind of sit there with that and see how that lands for you. Often we're working really hard and we feel like we should be rewarded for that hard work, but we're not necessarily doing it through the lens of the role we want. I think that's a really important distinction. Many of us get that initial promotion from like an individual contributor role to a leadership role because we're really proficient in the work we do. Okay. But what got you there won't get you where you want to go again. It just won't. It's a different level of performance. It's not about how my, you know, my expertise in this role anymore. It's now about how can I use that, my expertise in a different way? How do I express that expertise in more in, from a leadership perspective versus that tactical getting the work done perspective? Okay. If this is landing for you, again, let me know in the chat. I want to hear from you. Keep on putting stuff in that chat, communicating with each other, connecting with each other on this, because we're all in this together. Okay, so here's what I realized. This is really key. I am my problem and also my solution. I'm going to say that again. I am my problem and also my solution. So what is, after time, what did I realize my solution was? It was about developing my own self-leadership. You see, my position as a leader is that it's everything starts with us, all right? How do I show up for my team? How do I, what, how do I, how have I designed my brand? How intentional am I? How aware am I of the impact I have on others? So as I was navigating this whole process, I came up with this model. I'm going to just let it kind of sit here for a minute so you can take a look at it. It's this is, you know, I don't call it anything fancy. It's, it's my model for self-leadership. And you'll see that there are kind of three main themes as one navigates this kind of continuum. There's the exploration that we have to do to get to know ourselves better. And we do that through self-awareness and self-knowledge. Then once we've kind of, oh, okay, I'm learning some stuff about myself through curiosity, through being present and reflecting, learning some stuff about myself. Then we move to that next phase of embodiment when we embody our self-leadership. We do that through self-acceptance, through appreciation, appreciating what we're learning about ourselves, but also having some compassion for ourselves because we're going to have, you know, some sight into some mistakes we've made, some challenges. Oh, God, I had no idea I was showing up that way. So it's that level of acceptance. Then this is, you know, the 
the fourth pillar here of self-regard. This is kind of where the rubber meets the road. This is where, okay, I'm learning all of this about myself. I'm accepting who I am. Now, can, how does this impact my level of confidence? How does this impact my worthiness? Because often we get in our own way. This is the place where we hit the skids. If we do not see the contribution that we make, if we do not see the value that we bring, things come to a standstill. So it's important to call this out. And then finally, how do we move on to express our self-leadership? We do that through self-care. We do that in ways of, you know, we set boundaries so that we're not working two jobs, right? Where we're not working all these hours. We say, you know what, when 5, 5.30 comes along, I'm done. Now it's time for my life, my personal life, my family, whatever your priorities are. So setting boundaries. Also advocating for ourselves, speaking up when there's something that we want or need. How can we do that? When we have confidence and we know that we're worthy of it, it's an easy, you know, advocating for ourselves is an easier thing to do. And then finally, how do we express this through being selfless? This is around being vulnerable as leaders, but also being of service to others, supporting those women leaders who are coming after us. How do I sponsor? How do I mentor others? So you can see this is kind of soup to nuts. This is, a, you know, I learned this about myself and this has really been the foundation of the work that I do with women leaders. And so I want, what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of talk about the first two. We're going to focus on the exploration, okay, of our self-leadership. And so we're going to talk about self-awareness and self-knowledge. All right, so let's do this. Let's jump in. All right, we'll start with self-awareness. Okay. I, you know, there's so many explanations about what self-awareness is. And I found one that I like the most. So I'm going to read it uh, because I never seem to be able to memorize it, but I can read it for you. Uh, self-awareness is defined as a conscious underline conscious knowledge of one's own character, feelings, motives, and desires. So it is awareness is the key here. I am aware of who I am. I am aware of how I feel. I am a I am aware of what drives me. I am aware of what I want. Okay. Increasing our self-awareness requires being mindful of our emotions and what they are trying to tell us. All right, so we'll get a little deeper into that. Our emotions leave clues about our values, our motives, and our desires, okay? You would be hard pressed to find an article that is a current article that is talking about the attributes of great leaders and self-awareness is not on that list. You would, I mean, if you ever find one, you're going to have to let me know because I, I'm self-awareness is on every list that I've seen. Okay. But you can see here in this graphic, what makes up self-awareness. It's our intentions, our beliefs, our character, our qualities. It takes up a lot, but it's about being aware of all of these things about us. So if we want to develop our self-awareness, how can we do that? So I found this, I love mnemonics. I think this is a really helpful tool. And you'll notice pencil on this on the slide. You're going to want to take some notes here. But there are five components, five things that you can do to develop your self-awareness. And this mnemonic is called reaching for a mindful snack. All right. So let's define snack here. The first thing we want to do is stop. We have to be present to the moment to be able to notice what's going on. So let's say you're in the middle of a conversation with someone. I'm just going to create an example here. And it's, a, it's becoming a tense conversation. And you're starting to notice 
your throat is getting maybe a little constricted. Um, your stomach is maybe a little bit in knots. Your heart might be starting to beat a little faster. So if you've ever had this experience, your no, it's there's maybe a little anxiety coming up. It's like, okay, this is going to be a tough conversation, and I need to. I'm noticing that it's impacting me. All right. Emotions are physical responses to a circumstance. That circumstance is either an event, something has happened. Um, you know, it could be something that somebody says, but something has happened that is activating an emotion. So our job is first to stop and then notice that it's happening. Okay. Then we need to accept it. We can't change what we don't accept to be true. Okay. We can't do anything about something we're denying. Often that will happen. We have an emotional response to something and we just push it down. I don't have time for this. I'm too busy. I'm not going to pay. If you, if you have experienced this, go ahead and put it in the, in the chat. Yes, Camille. I've definitely experienced this, but we have to accept it in order to change it. So if I can say, wow, okay, I'm, you know, this is an internal conversation I'm having. Wow, I'm noticing that this conversation is really triggering me, right? Or upsetting me. I need to take care of myself here. So it's accepting that it exists. Then it's about being curious. Okay, what exactly is happening? Okay, they said something that triggered me. Um, what is it that they said? Why would I be triggered? And you, the, again, these are, you know, this is a, this might be after the conversation, you've concluded it. Now you want to kind of, I'll use the word debrief, but you're almost like, just, I'm going to reflect on what, what triggered me in that conversation? What can I learn about myself? That's the curiosity. And we're doing this with kindness for ourselves. You know, nobody can beat me up the way I do. I can, I will, oh my God, Camille, you should have known better than that. I can, sh I should all over myself. And so this happens to be the spot where I get tripped up is being kind to myself and saying, look, okay, you know, you're a human, you're going to have reactions. And so I find this to be from start to finish, a really nice way of kind of checking in. So again, this is a way of developing our awareness. Often, it, it, a lot of this is going to happen after the event. You take a few deep breaths to kind of re, you know, recalibrate your nervous system. Taking those deep breaths is helpful, but just this is a reflective opportunity to say, oh, you know what? I'm, And then I'm noticing I've had similar conversations and I've had the similar response. So this is, you know, this is when we get to notice those common threads, those trends that we get to learn about ourselves, right? It's like, oh, wow, this is not the first time and it probably won't be the last time that something like this happens. But because I'm becoming more aware I'll be able to then create my own strategies for dealing with it, okay? Because sometimes these things can be painful. So think about, I mean, I hope this is a helpful, you know, again, mnemonic. Okay, I need to just, I need to take, I need to reach for a mindful snack, okay? So I love this quote. Um, if you're if you like to read, and this is an interesting topic for you, I would highly recommend Susan David um, and her book Emotional Agility. Um, if you want to hear more about it, she has a TED Talk, not too long. You know, TED Talks are usually pretty short, but if you take a look at it, um, it's very popular. There's a, a gazillion views on this TED Talk, but she says emotions are data, not directions. <laughs> And I remember the first time I read that and I actually giggled a little bit. I thought, oh my God, that is so funny because we often think that an emotion is licensed to act on it and it is not. 
So, you know, how many times have I can't, I couldn't even count the number of times I've had an emotion and my go-to response was to express anger. And then I regret it. And then I have to amend for it. And I, anger is a valid emotion, a valid response. And do I need to act on it? No. Can I manage it? Yes. So emotions are, it's information. It's saying something is happening that I want you to pay attention to. Your body is telling you, I want you to pay attention to this and learn something about yourself from this. Some of the things that she says, and I have some notes here, is that it's key to notice our emotions as they occur. That's the stop and notice part of the snack acronym, okay? Recognize those emotions as information to explore. And then notice patterns of how our emotions connect us to our values. Our values are those things that are important to us. And often our emotions are saying a value is being challenged. Okay. Or activated in some way because emotions are also good emotions. I'm happy. I'm feeling joy because play is something that's important to me and I'm having a great time right now. So it's about paying attention to all of it. Um, one thing she says is that if you don't self-observe, you can't self-correct. Love that. So I want to take a look at some of the chat here. Thank you. You guys are sending some great, I love that, human being, not human doing. Thank you, Cassie. Totally. I hear you. Okay. Remember that you are a human being. Okay. Um, I think it gets tricky when you don't want to be, oh, shit, if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of call this out. I think it gets tricky when you don't want to be reinforcing behavior that is triggering, disrespectful, invasive. So sometimes it's confusing not to act on anger. I hear you. And something I've done for me, I can only speak for myself, is that when I'm feeling that anger, I may need to remove myself from the situation. It's like, you know, and I might, and I've actually said this, you know, I hear what you're saying. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm having kind of a strong reaction to it. I, I think it's important for us to have this conversation. What I'd like to do is take a break for a minute and then come back. Is that okay with you? Because I think this is an important conversation to have. I just want to kind of get my thoughts together. So that may land for some of you as an option, but that's also, that's self-care. That's that self-advocacy part I talked about in, my, in the model of taking care of yourself in situations, okay? So Ocean, what that might mean is I'm going to step away and I'm going to come back to, you know, I noticed that when you said that I got really angry and I didn't want to necessarily be angry in the moment so that I appreciate the time to kind of think about it. Here's what my request is. And then you can make a request. So if, you, if we want behavior to change, then we make a request. We may not get it. And then we have decisions to make about the relationship, right? So, but we do need to ask for what we want. Mm -hmm. And I get it, Ocean. I tend to freeze and confusingly act the opposite. Exactly. Buy yourself some time. Buy yourself some time. I hope that's helpful. Okay. So let's kind of button up the self-awareness um, topic. How does your current level of self-awareness impact how you show up, your brand, as a leader? Do you need to get some more information? Do you need to learn more about yourself? That takes us to the second pillar, which is self-knowledge. So self-awareness tends to be more of an internal process, right? We're stopping, we're reflecting, we're being present in the moment. And self-knowledge takes it to the next level. It, it can be more, okay, now I need to take a deeper dive. What are, you know, what is it that makes me unique? And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But if you want to understand 
how you impact others, we need to know how we impact them. Okay. Now, I don't know. I'm going to throw this out there because I think this is actually kind of funny. When I was a hiring manager, I don't know that I ever asked this question, but I, I, I've heard of people who do. In an interview, have you ever been asked, what three words would your friends use to describe you? I'm curious if anybody has ever heard that question and we're kind of like taken aback. It's like, uh oh, what would they say about me? I have no idea what they would say about me. Okay. Yeah, kind of like it, Kathy, right? I know. I hate that. <laughs> I've gotten that asked a lot, right? So sometimes I want to have those answers in my hip pocket. Okay. Well, guess what? If you want to find out how you impact other people, ask them. Okay. I'm going to go back a bit here. There is an exercise that you can do. Um, to find out. Um, and I would encourage you, if you are willing to do this, please do it. Okay. Um, and you would want to ask, you know, I would say ask 10 people, what three words would you use to describe me? You can do this in a text. Do not, I mean, here's the, here's the rule. Do not do it. There's a couple rules. But the first rule, do not do this in a group text. Do this one by one, but pick 10 people. It could be family. It could be close friends. It could be coworkers. I would say pick people who you might identify as loving critics, okay? They love you and they would tell you the truth, all right? So pick 10 people, up to 10 people. And just ask them the question. Now, invariably, I will tell you, somebody's going to come back and say, why? You can say, well, I went to this workshop and Camille suggested that we do this exercise. I want to find out how I impact other people. Just, you know, answer the question. Um, but And then wait for the answers to come in. Okay. Now, what may happen is that you get words that you're not really happy about. And I want to share with you the words that I got when I did this exercise. I learned about it about five years ago and did this myself. And so here are the words that I got. I want you to kind of take a moment and, and look at them. And any of them that you see that um, have an asterisk, I got more than once from different people. Okay. So, you know, I looked at this list and I was like, you know, as I was, as they were coming in, I was just, oh, wow. I mean, I was really touched and honored kind of. It's like, wow, you really, this is how you see me. This is really great. And what I noticed with that was that there were a couple of words in here that kind of tripped me up a little bit. The first one was this one, habitual. And I thought, oh, what does that mean? The second one was meticulous. Now, these in and of themselves are not bad words, but they, they weren't how I saw myself. I definitely see myself as motivated. I see myself as enthusiastic, professional, organized, right? But I never had thought about myself as habitual or meticulous. I always kind of thought myself as a pretty go with the flow kind of gal, right? So this kind of tripped me up a little bit. But then I kind of thought about it, and particularly that habitual one, I thought, okay, is it true? And the answer is yes, it is true, especially in the context in which the person who used this word, how she and I know each other, okay? And so I had to think, well, of course she thinks I'm habitual, and I'll share this quickly. We both belong to the same group. And so pre-COVID, we would meet in person in a meeting room. And I typically got there early because I was driving a little further than most. And so I would get there early. And so I kind of got to pick the chair I wanted. And I tend to want to pick a chair um, with the door to, the, to my back because I tend to get distracted when people are kind of coming in the room, not paying attention. So... 
if I have my back to the door, then I'm not seeing people coming in. And it's a way for me to stay focused on what's in front of me. So for me, there was a, a method to my madness, if you will. But to her, it was like, Camille needs to sit in the same chair. And it's not really, that's not true. I don't have to sit in the same chair. I'm choosing to. So the moral of the story is, if you choose to do this exercise and you get some words that kind of throw you or you just flat out don't like, do not go back and say, what do you mean by that? Just sit with it. Your job is just to receive the information. This is only information, okay? If there are words that you're not crazy about, I want you to take the time over the, you know, the next week or so to just kind of observe yourself. This is going to be your exercise in self-awareness and reflection, just to be aware. Am I showing up that way? Can I see how somebody would see that? in me. So this is a way of building that self-awareness muscle. Okay. So what I'd love for you to do is in your action guide, go ahead and this is the start of, of designing your brand. What three words would you want people to use to describe you? So write them in your action guide and then go ahead and if you're willing, share them in the chat, share them with your colleagues today. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and continue. So what is it? A bit ago, I talked about what it is that makes you unique. And the things that make us unique are our strengths and our, and our weaknesses, okay? Our talents and gifts. You know, our talents are those things that we can just kind of, you know, I flippantly will just say it's kind of the stuff we can do in our sleep, right? It's the stuff that comes naturally to us but maybe to somebody else, they see you doing it and it's like superhuman. There's like no way they could do it. But it, for you, it just kind of comes naturally, okay? Gifts are the things that we can give away. What can I do for others? How can I be of service to others, right? But then also our values, those things that drive how we set priorities in our lives, how we spend our time, you know, the things that are really important to us. Those are the things that make us unique. Now you might say, well, how are strengths making me unique? I could have the same strength as the person in the next cubicle. And that may be true, but how you express your strengths, how you express your talents and gifts and your values are what really make you unique. Okay. So let's kind of focus on one of them in particular. And that is about strengths. When I work with my coaching clients, we do a strengths assessment. Um, there's strengths finders. There's all kinds out there that you can do. Thank you, Anand. Professional, organized, and empathetic. Nice. Thank you for sharing. Um, but I do a different assessment that kind of, um, it does analyze through your responses to the, to the self-assessment. Um, you know, taking a lot at look at a library of 60 strengths and kind of pegging them into different categories where they are for you and the strength of those strengths, if you will. Okay. So what is a strength? Thank you, Dorianne. Empathetic, intelligent, a catalyst. Ooh, you get things done. Action. Good for you. Okay. So what is a strength? A strength is something we're good at or we perform well. Okay. And when you do it, it's energizing. The real you comes through and you have opportunities to use it. All three of these must be in place for it to be an actual strength. An example, I am really good at math. It does not energize me. I have opportunities to use it. My checkbook balances to the penny all the time. <laughs> but it doesn't energize me. I do it because I must, okay? So would I call that a strength? No, I wouldn't. I would call it a learned behavior. I would say it's something I'm good at, but it's not necessarily something that I love doing, you know, that I love to do all day. No, not at all, okay? So what I'd love you to do now is in your action guide, I want you to list one or two strengths, given that definition. You perform it well, it energizes you, 
think of it like I, the real me comes through. I can lose, you know, I'm like, I can go into autopilot doing this. And you actually have an opportunity to use it. So go ahead and write that in your action guide. Okay. And are there any strengths you wish you can use more? Because we can have strengths, but we don't get to use them. Those are called unrealized strengths. You perform them well, they energize you, but the opportunity isn't there. Okay. So what are one or two strengths and are there any strengths you wish you could use more? Okay. Now let's kind of put a, you know, put a close to this topic. Reflection. How would tapping into your strengths, talents, gifts, and values up-level your effectiveness as a leader? Okay. Here's a hint. Your confidence will skyrocket. When you can use your strengths, okay, and you're energized, how confident do you feel? I want you to think of a time when you got, when you were using your strengths and you felt great. You felt good about what you were doing, confident in what you were doing. So let's kind of go back and we're going to just go back a bit to the model. We spent some time today doing, you know, in an overview of the first two building blocks of the model, which are self-awareness and self-knowledge. Again, when I'm working with my clients, we take it further. We work on acceptance and self-regard. How does my new awareness and knowledge and my acceptance of these attributes impact my confidence, impact my worthiness? And then finally, how do we express? Remember, this is what this is the difference. This is what makes us unique. How do we express ourselves, all of these things through boundaries and self-advocacy, through vulnerability and being of service to others? I'm looking at the time. We're kind of coming quick here. I will say, um, we have just a few more slides here, but what I'd love for you to do, because I'm going to have some stuff, you know, some gifts for you here, is uh, you're going to need your phone. I have, I'm a QR code fanatic, so I'm going to give you some opportunities for some a few things here. So what's next? Three actions that you can take now. Connect to your emotions through presence and reaching for a mindful snack. Okay. Check in with others. What words do they use to describe you? Be curious about yourself. Get clear on your strengths, talents, gifts, and values and how they inform your unique brand. Again, in your action guide, what is one bite-sized action you can commit to? What's one thing you learned today that you're willing to try? Go ahead and put that in your action guide. So what I would love to do is offer you a free resource. This is in my uh, in my website. If you take a picture of this QR code, it will take you to a page called The Building Blocks of Self-Leadership. Scroll to the bottom. It'll ask you to enter your name and email address, and, it, and then you will get um, the actual resource. And over in the next few days, some emails from me that kind of deepen what this resource provides. Um, it's I think it's a seven or eight page resource. There's some values exercises in there, some strengths exercises in there, things that you can do to kind of get started. So go ahead. And again, this is a free resource. If at some point you decide I don't want to be on Camille's waiting list, you can always opt out. You can unsubscribe. I won't take it personally, but I'd love it if you'd kind of stick with me. I do share stuff on LinkedIn. Um, hang on, I'm going to keep that there for a minute. I do share stuff on LinkedIn. And in a moment, I'll share my link if you want to follow me on LinkedIn. I have a newsletter that I send out every month. I share um, articles that I think are really relevant. And, um, you know, but I don't spam people with a lot of stuff. Okay. So here's some stuff I know for sure. Great leadership starts with developing one's self-leadership. 
a rising tide lifts all boats. <laughs> Self-leadership isn't about you at work. It's just about you at work. It transforms all areas of your life. Um, you can become that inspiring, empowering, and empowering leader people want to follow. So if this is you doing way too many things at once, you're on the phone, having a glass of wine and running on that treadmill, and you want to get off that treadmill, <laughs> you're ready to focus on you and what you need, and you're ready to invest in yourself and become free from your limiting stories and beliefs, let's schedule a call. Um, I am offering a complimentary 30-minute coaching call to any of you who are interested. This QR code will take you to my calendar. You are welcome to, there's not a whole lot of space, so you want to sign up today. The link in your action guide on page three also takes you to that. Um, so go ahead and do that. I would love to hear your story and maybe, you know, in a brief call, we can come up with at least one idea for you. You can also follow me on LinkedIn. This QR code will take you to my LinkedIn page where you can follow and connect with me if you'd like. And I want to go ahead and look at the questions. See if there's anything here. I'm not seeing anything in the questions. You guys have been super engaged in the chat. Um, if anybody has any questions and they want to pop that in there, we have another minute or so. I don't think they cut me off completely, but um, if you want to put something in there, that would be terrific. I'm going to open that up and see if anything comes up. Not seeing anything, but I wanna thank you. Wow, finished right on time. I wanna thank you all for spending the gosh, better part of an hour with me today. I hope this was valuable. I hope um, if there's anything that I can do, again, set up that call, I would love to, to have a chat with you and see if there's a way that I can support you as a coach. Um, oh, I see somebody has put something in here. Um, what um, what if the, okay. What if the way people describe you isn't the way you would describe yourself? Then that means that there is some misalignment, right? Of how you see yourself. And again, look at the way they describe you. And if you are emotionally charged at all by those words, that's when you want to take a pause, step back and say, oh, I don't want to actually do this now because I'm kind of activated. But what you can do is once you've kind of set with it for a bit, there's nothing that says when you're in, you know, if you're having a conversation with this person, you know what I noticed when I asked you, you mentioned this word. Can you tell me more about what that looks like for you? That's a non-threatening way. There's no, somebody's not going to get defensive. They're going to say, well, let me tell you, know, here's what I, here's why. And so you can dig a little bit deeper there, okay? So I hope that's helpful. And yeah, just kind of notice it. And if you want, that's why we need to design our brand versus let it just be a default. If your goal, if, the, if a word you want people to use to describe you is um, calm, then set that intention to enter any interactions with people in a calm way. That's how we design it and that's how we express it. Okay. I'm seeing some other questions. Let's see. Um, at what time is it appropriate to push feedback to the side? Somebody gives it, it doesn't feel accurate versus time. Um, we should investigate challenging our connecting values. At what time is it appropriate to push feedback to the side? I think, I think you have to kind of look at the relationship and the interaction that you have with this individual and just really kind of assess, is this specific to the context in which I know this person? You know, I think you really have to look at the bigger picture, Dorian, in that regard and see, okay, does this, is this like a very minimal interaction that I have with this person? Um, and then, because often there's going to be data, right? We get data points that are just anomalies. We set them aside. 
So, um, Dorianne, if you want to set up a call, maybe we can, if there's something in particular you want to talk about, we can certainly do that. So, um, ah, I like this. I am described as a people person and I would like to not be um, a continuous doormat, <laughs> but would like to be more of that pro of a process person. Then set that intention. Then absolutely set that intention. Everybody, it's about two minutes before noon. I don't want to hold anybody up. Probably going to have to call it done. Um, but thank you again. I appreciate um, you spending this time with me. And I hope you have a great the rest of your conference. Enjoy everything that is being offered to you. And we will talk soon. Thank you.